Okay, we're um, ready to get started. If everyone could please take their seats. Good morning. Welcome to um, day two of the um, OARC Fall Workshop. Um, I think almost everybody in the room today was here yesterday. Welcome if you were not. I'm Keith Mitchell, OARC President. A few quick announcements before we start. Um, these are the wireless networks. Um, there was an issue with the 8021X authentication encryption network yesterday. That seems to be working okay today, but please shout if it's not. There was another issue with the network um, with latency. Um, we had the Nano guys look at it last night, but it still doesn't appear to be resolved. It appears to be functioning otherwise. If anyone can find any really cool diagnostics to tell us why we're getting this strange delay on the network, they'd love to hear from you. Um, so um, just to run through, um, the coffee break will be at the back of the room again. Um, the lunch will be upstairs in the Hoshalaga room. Please make sure you're wearing your badges today. Um, we do not want your lunch eaten by Nanog people, um, so we, um, we need to enforce that. Um, and again, as per yesterday, if you have any special dietary requirements, make these to the, clear to the, um, the, the, the servers. Um, Thank you to Sira as the um, social sponsor last night. Um, I certainly enjoyed myself. I hope you, um, you all did as well. <laughs> We're doing a PGP signing session at lunchtime. Um, Maurizio um, Jonah is um, kindly running that. So um, there's probably still time to get your key to him if you didn't do that already. That will be in here um, at one o'clock. So if you're doing PGP, grab your lunch quickly, come back down here. Um, everyone else be, be lunching up in the break room. Um, and a reminder that we're webcasting. Um, so um, please make sure that you don't make beeping noises during proceedings. If you've got questions to ask, please line up at the microphone um, and identify yourself and your affiliation, and then we'll, uh, we'll feed you into the stream. Um, I think we've got all the slide decks, so thank you speakers for all of that. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. So um, this morning's first session is an operational theme. Um, the um, session chair is Sebastian Castro, who is, of course, also our um, program committee chair. Um, so I will hand you over to um, Sebastian to introduce the individual speakers. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone. Should I speak? Loudly or whispering? I don't know. You don't look very hang on. Yeah, some of you. Anyway, um, I'm really happy to be chairing this session. Uh, and also, I'm really happy to introduce uh, the next, next speaker from OpenDNS. Uh, for those who have been around DNS Org uh, for a long time, OpenDNS used to go and present that DNS Org, and then they came apart, but we, we were able to convince them, yeah, you should, it's in Montreal, it's close to your headquarters, you should come by, and we are really happy to have them there. So we have Brian Somers from OpenDNS talking about managing DNS, the, uh, denial of service attacks. Please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Brian Sermons. I work at OpenDNS as a site reliability engineer. Um, that basically means that I'm responsible for getting configuration changes to the resolvers at OpenDNS and responsible for enhancing the resolvers and making them uh, uh, scale and be more reliable. Um, I'm gonna talk about denial of service attacks. Um, there's really three types of den denial of service attack. <clears throat> there's the accidental attack. Um, so that's usually a misconfigured um, downstream name server or maybe a misconfigured development machine where it queries local hosts over and over again. We see a lot of this at the uh, uh, root servers because, of course, recursive servers will just pass that stuff through to, to root. Um, and then, of course, they'll cache the negative, uh, negative result. Um, we also see amplification attacks. So these were quite popular, not as much anymore, but they were quite popular a year or so ago. Um, usually an amplification attack has a falsified source address. 
the source address is the address of the target of the attack. Um, and they're usually done through uh, uh, handcrafted uh, domains owned by the bad guys. And those domains will have uh, prepared answers of specific sizes. So you might have a 1K response size, a 2K response size, a 4K response size, et cetera. And they'll pre-probe the uh, recursive resolver to see what sort of a response size the recursive resolver is happy to send. So they'll ask for EDNS buff size equals 4096, which is usually the, the cap that most people put in it. Um, they'll uh, find um, that they can send a, a query, get a 4K response. Then they start falsifying the target's IP number as the source address of their queries. They fire lots of small queries at the recursive resolver and the recursive resolver sends lots of large answers to the attack target. And then the third and most difficult type of uh, um, attack um, uh, to deal with is the random label attack or NX domain attack. Um, so this is uh, an attack that appears to be um, an attack against an authority. Um, it's usually done through a domain, again, owned by the bad guys. Um, but the domain's name servers are pointed at the target of the IP of the attack. So if I own a domain called badguys.com, I might set my name servers um, uh, addresses to be the attack target. And then I send lots of queries to my domain. And of course, the recursive resolver queries the target. And the nature of the queries are that the queue name will contain a random label um, as the first label. So the recursive resolver won't have it in the cache and must send the query upstream. And upstream, in this case, is the target recipient. Um, usually, of course, it's done through a botnet. So there are lots and lots of machines um, sending lots and lots of queries. And they're falsifying source addresses as well, which makes it even more difficult to determine who's actually doing the damage. So to handle the kind of first two denial of service attack types, the accidental attack and the ampl amplification attack, that's fairly straightforward because we can work on the basis that the source address is a constant. Um, in the case of accidental, nobody's doing anything wrong intentionally, so usually it's all coming from one IP number. And in the case of the amplification attack, the source IP number is the, um, the target of the attack. So it's easy to do rate limiting based on um, source addresses. So to do the rate limiting based on source addresses, we hash the source address, we map it into a table, and then in each of those table entries, we record the IP number that is actually um, attacking, and we record statistics about the transactions that they're giving us. So those statistics would include the uh, number of specific query types they're sending, so the number of A records, and, uh, the number of A queries, the number of quad A queries, et cetera. Um, or it might um, include the response size or whether or not we've identified them as a customer and what sort of a customer we've identified them as. So we keep statistics on all of this information and we have rate limits um, based on each of these statistics. And if they blow any of those rate limits, then they're put in the doghouse. And by being put in the doghouse, this essentially means that we start dropping transactions on the floor. Um, we drop transactions on the floor for a second period, um, and then in the next second, we carry over whether or not they were being dropped from the previous second, and if they were, then we reduce their rate limit. Um, at the moment, our configuration says reduce it by 10%, so over the course of 10, uh, 10 seconds, a sustained attack will, re um, will end up ha um, having us drop everything except for one query. Um, we cap the, uh, the, the lower threshold at one. And this is um, quite amusing in the case of amplification attacks because, of course, the um, attacker doesn't see any of the response traffic and they don't see the fact that we're dropping it all on the floor and, and only actually forwarding one uh, response. But the more interesting sort of attack is um, the random label attack or the NX domain attack. So to handle these, we have a mechanism in place which identifies global attacks. And this is difficult, although not impossible, to do at the resolver level. Um, so instead, we do it in our statistics level. So every one of our resolvers sends a query log to our backend big data systems. And they um, uh, 
consolidate all of these query logs into a, a single stream and then have analyzers sitting on those streams to figure out whether or not an attack is taking place. Um, so an attack is, uh, is um, identified as being something where um, <coughs> uh, we see a, a huge increase in the number of domains being queried. So <coughs> we have to be seeing at least 500 unique domains being queried in a 10 second period. Um, this is unusual for smaller sites, not unusual for larger sites. But if combined with that, we also see 95% of the traffic is actually a negative response, and 30% of that at least is a serve fail, then we decide that this is definitely not normal and it qualifies as a global attack. So of course, there are lots of um, different sized domains out there. So identifying it as a global attack isn't good enough to know exactly what to do yet. So we do one of three things when we identify a global attack like this. So the first and simplest is the domain drop list. So if the domain in question, um, if it has uh, less than 100 queries per hour on average over the last two weeks, then it's a very, very unqueried domain. And our way of managing this is to um, insert the domain name into a domain drop list, feed it back to the resolvers, and the resolvers literally just drop the packets on the floor. So they receive, um, receive the query, they compare it against the drop list, they keep a statistic, and they drop it on the floor. The client gets, um, gets no response because we reckon that the source addresses are, are falsified anyway. And the slightly more complicated case is for um, domains that have... Um, if I can get this pointing. So for domains that um, have between 100 and 500,000 queries per hour um, over the past two weeks as an average. Um, so these are, are domains that people are clearly using. So it's not um, okay for us to drop the traffic on the floor. People will complain. So we need a better mechanism for handling this sort of thing. So we invented the domain freeze list. So the, the idea behind the freeze list um, requires a little bit of explanation about how our cache works. So our cache is a pre-allocated chunk of memory. Um, most resolvers these days pre-allocate 10 gigs of memory. And um, the cache consists of a head pointer and a tail pointer chasing each other um, in a circular fashion through memory. Um, the normal um, uh, rotation period of this, this memory is about a day. So generally, when we um, cache a record in the recursive resolver, that record will survive for a day irrespective of its TTL. Um, when we look things up, we find things in the cache and we will then examine the TTL and see if it's um, uh, something that we can return or if it's something that we have to look, um, look up upstream. But bearing that in mind, um, the data that we have available to us is expired and unexpired data. So when we put um, one of these uh, attack domains into the freeze list, the way we handle the freeze list is when we receive an incoming query, we check to see if it's in the freeze list. If it is in the freeze list, um, then we check to see if it's in the cache. And if it's also in the cache, whether expired or not expired, then it escapes the freeze list. So it's, it's a permissible query. And of course, if the TTL is expired, we'll, we'll go and look it up upstream. If it's not in the cache at all, it means that we've never looked this up before, and it's likely that this is actually just one of the attack um, domains, so we drop it on the floor after keeping the statistic, of course. Um, we get the occasional false positive at this level, but very rarely. We've had a handful of them in the last um, uh, several months, um, less than 10. <clears throat> so just to give you um, a little bit, bit of perspective on, on um, what this data really means, um, I'm not sure how, how readable any of the, um, uh, uh, the x-axis or y-axis um, text is, but this is a graph that just represents our dropped data. So it's just comparing different dropped data types against um, themselves. And this, this magenta area is the traffic that we're dropping due to the drop list. You can see the small blue sections that are freeze list data. So, and um, you can also see the, the yellow area, which is rate limited data. So the bulk of what we actually drop is stuff that goes into the drop list. 
and we get almost no false positives out of that. I think we've had two um, since we implemented this a year and a half ago. And then to give you an idea about um, what our ratios look like, so this, this graph kind of shows you your normal traffic patterns. So this is across two days, and you can see the, uh, um, the daily pattern of lots of activity, and then night, nighttime comes along, and there's very little activity. Um, the blue area at the bottom is our error rate. So this is um, stuff that doesn't make sense um, that, that we're um, uh, returning negative responses for. And then the green section in the center is the traffic that we're dropping. So you can see from this that really we're, we're um, in, in non-peak times, we're dropping 40% of, of, um, of our data on this specific resolver. And on a global level, um, uh, this, this actually means that we're really receiving about 95 billion queries a day. And of them, we're dropping 15 billion on the floor without even responding to them. So taking a step back um, from uh, denial of service attacks where we're actually receiving attacks from clients, there is another scenario that we, we noticed was taking place where we're essentially supplying the denial of service attack to the authority just because we're being stupid. Um, and this generally is um, an attack that we accidentally do due to the fact that the authority fails to respond for some reason. So that might be because they're under attack, they're having problems um, uh, getting the responses out. Um, it might be because of latency issues and they're not quite um, uh, responding within um, some of our preset timeouts. Um, or they might be under maintenance, somebody might be rebooting the service, um, uh, anything like that. And one of the things to, to um, uh, understand about uh, what happens when an authority goes away, um, usually if, for example, we're querying Facebook, we'd have a, um, a TTL of 30 seconds, which means that our resolvers should really be asking them one question for the given queue name every 30 seconds. If they stop responding, the semantics of that changes so that we actually start querying them every whatever our timeout is for client requests seconds. So if our timeout for client requests is five seconds, then we'll start sending them a query every five seconds. And also, because we don't cache the serve file results that we're getting back from the, the upstream, each thread or each worker thread within our resolver, which are usually configured to 10 threads and there's several resolvers in the data center, each of those threads is attempting to um, query the, the upstream. So if the upstream um, has any sort of um, traffic shaping in, in place, they'll notice this huge increase in queries from one given IP number and they'll add us to their firewall. So we want to avoid that and we also want to avoid sending useless queries and waiting for um, long timeouts um, before we can actually respond to our customers. So anyway, to, to explain this a little bit kind of clearer about what we do, <clears throat> this, is, this is how I think of it um, in my mind. So the vertical um, column on the left-hand side is our timeouts. And these are predefined timeouts, so 0.35 of a second, 0.6 of a second, 1, 2, 4 seconds. And the resolver um, lays out um, uh, these, these timeouts in memory in, in, in a vertical column like this. And then the name servers that are responsible for the zone that we're querying um, going uh, left to right. And of course, the name servers are shuffled, um, as the specs say. And essentially what the resolver's plan is, is it will go from bottom to top, left to right, and it will query each name server until it gets a, um, an answer. So it'll query name server zero at 0.35 of a second. If it doesn't, doesn't respond in 0.35 of a second, we move on to name server one, name server two. Then we move on to timeout 0.6, and then we go name server zero, one, two, and we um, go through the cycle. And when we get to the top, we um, decide that we failed and we send a serve fail back to the client, but usually we'll have some sort of other timeout taking place first. So our um, total timeout is, is six seconds at the moment, so that will happen before we, we reach the top. So what we implemented in this case was um, we taught the resolver to remember the round trip times of the authoritative responses. So as we go through this array from left to right, bottom to top, um, and the first uh, NS0 doesn't respond, we'll set the uh, RTT to 0.35 of a second and move on to the next one. 
If that didn't respond, we'd set that to 0.35 of a second, move on to the next one. And then when we get back to the 0.6 timeout, um, we'd send that name server zero another query because 0.35 is less than 0.6. And if it doesn't respond, we bump the RTT up to 0.6. So imagining we've done this a few times, we've got round trip times for all of the, the name servers. The next time we come in with a scenario like, uh, like the diagram shows, We'll come in and we'll do our first query um, against name server zero, um, except we won't because it's got a round trip time of greater than 0.35 of a second, so there's no point that name server doesn't respond that quickly. So we'll move right along to name server one, we'll send that a query. If we didn't get a response from that, we'd move on to name server two, and we wouldn't send that a query because it has a ridiculously large round trip time, it's probably down or something. Um, and we'll move back onto our 0.6 sec um, of a second timeout and we'll um, spin through, through the loop that way. So these round trip times essentially are vehicles for accelerating, accelerating ourselves through the, the query loop and potentially falling off the top of the query loop either really quickly or at least in a way that allows us to identify when a resolver doesn't respond um, at the four second level, it's put in a timeout. So we decide that that resolver is down, or that um, authoritative resolver is down, and um, we should stop querying it. And at the moment, our, our stop querying time is 40 seconds. <clears throat> so if all three of your name servers get, uh, um, get pushed off the top of this graph, then you query, um, query one of those uh, um, uh, queue names, and you get immediate serve fails. And just going back to the previous slide, um, this, this actually um, satisfies a few um, other uh, minor inconveniences. One of the things that we noticed, for example, is in our Hong Kong um, data center, um, the number of queries that we do to authorities is proportionally way higher than um, any other data center. And that's because there's a lot of latency going on, perhaps due to um, uh, bad network equipment or just congestion. Um, so one of the, um, the things that this solves is that if you're querying a domain and you've got some local authorities, um, some uh, uh, name servers that are local, some name servers that are further away, the further away name servers will be pushed um, upwards in terms of round trip times and we'll end up querying the ones that are local to the resolver that you actually end up talking to as a customer, which is very convenient because it makes our latency look better or smaller. So just to give you, um, uh, uh, I guess, a, a, um, a feel for, for what we actually see in terms of, um, of uh, attack traffic. Um, so I've been looking at these graphs, and this, this is an attack that happened in June. Um, and I've been looking at these graphs and um, getting less and less confident that I actually know what any of these numbers mean. Um, graphs are a little bit like that for me. Um, you kind of look at something, you identify it, you say, yes, I know exactly what's causing this, and then the more you look, the, the, the less sure you are. Um, so this, this first graph, um, so, so one of the interesting things that we've seen um, about these uh, random label attacks or NX domain attacks is that they mostly come from China, and it seems to be um, some sort of attack as a service service that's running over there. Um, it looks as if people um, pay other people for the attack privileges. They give them some IP numbers to attack, and then they attack for a given amount of time. So they probably, they probably bought a timeshare um, um, from these attack servers. And what we, what we usually see is, is as the attack begins, or just before the attack begins, there's an attack somewhere else that then moves to the target. So in this case, um, what we did see, um, I've lost my pointer, there it is. Um, we see the attack start and all of a sudden this huge pink section, same as the previous um, uh, graph, represents dropped data. So this is a domain that's being um, attacked with this um, random label data. It's a domain that um, has almost no queries otherwise. Um, and all of a sudden has 95% negative um, responses to um, a huge number of queries. Um, and this actually goes on for four hours. So this, the width of this is, is four hours. 
And then all of a sudden something else happens. The, um, it looks like the attackers redirected their attack and they're now attacking a different domain. And that different domain is being rate limited. So this yellow um, demonstrates that we're rate limiting stuff. Um, on the next page, we'll, we'll see exactly how that rate limit breaks down. And then I originally thought that the authority tried to stand up their name servers again and failed. And then they stood them up successfully for a while and then they, came, they fell over again. But on hindsight, that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, this doesn't seem to be um, how the attack was, was played out at all. So the attack was on a domain called okcoin.com. And okcoin.com has um, a reasonable number of um, queries per hour. It has something in the, in the region of two or 3,000 queries per hour. So it falls into our freeze list um, attack range. However, freeze list on this um, graph, for anybody with really good um, eyes and the ability to zoom in and clarify, um, freeze list is in blue in this graph. So you can see all of the blue for any of us who aren't um, colorblind. So there was no freeze list attack. So the OK domain, the OK coin domain, didn't actually appear in the freeze list here. And in fact, this second graph um, uh, confirms this. So the second graph is our serve fail graph. So this, this just shows us our number of serve fail responses, which has a huge hike right as, as soon as this drop list drops off. But the other interesting um, uh, thing that appears in this gra graph is our smart cache. Now our smart cache is another um, facility that we sell our customers. Um, which is a tick box that they can, um, they can use to say, if the authority is down and returning serve fail, then instead of giving me serve fail, give me stale traffic or st stale responses. So we'll give them a stale response that has a zero TTL, asking them not to cache it, but it's supposedly better than, than no response at all. And in this case, we saw a huge hike in these smart caches which means that whatever was getting those serve fails was actually querying with valid query traffic that was in the cache. Um, of course, you could also argue that the, um, the attack was um, against okcoin.com. It was in the freeze list, but the attack traffic was all non-random um, label tra traffic, but was actually real traffic. But I don't buy that either because um, uh, there wouldn't be that amount of traffic that was returning non-negative responses. Um, and then just to give you an idea of, of the kind of uh, ratios here, um, so this, this is our negative response graph and this, um, this salmon color at the top is the serve fails and these are the other negative responses, so NX domains and then this tiny little kind of other R codes like form error and all the rest of them. Um, so all of these negative responses are, are completely new negative responses that aren't kind of other negative responses becoming serve fails. And then to, to give you a little bit um, more of a kind of perspective over what the size of the attack was, this is our original kind of um, traffic pattern. <clears throat> so this traffic pattern was, I would say, going to look like this and was going to go along here and this kind of load on top is the actual attack. And the, that load is actually represented by this stripe here. So the increase in green and blue on the, on the graph is the actual attack um, uh, traffic. <clears throat> the normal responses are not affected by this. It's just a stacked graph, so that's why the, uh, the, the top line is different. Um, and in fact, um, there was a whole bunch of um, uh, dropped data um, and uh, these, these blue sections are errors. So what they were sending was stuff that was um, either being, dro was being dropped for one reason or another or was error traffic. So maybe malformed packets, etc. cetera. Um, one of the interesting things that we have seen from these um, uh, um, random label attacks is that sometimes they get the random labels wrong and they'll um, do things like um, add double dots to the random label, that sort of thing. Um, so their algorithms aren't, per aren't perfect for um, generating these labels. And I guess uh, the, the kind of last thing of interest with respect to the, the attack um, in terms of rate limiting, um, 
there was um, this, this yellow on, the, on this graph um, represents oversized packets. So part of this attack resulted in oversized responses. I mean, we have a, a much more strict rate limit for oversized responses. So if you send us um, 30 queries per second, um, which solicit oversized responses, where an oversized response is more than 1410 uh, bytes, then we'll rate limit you much more strictly at that point. <clears throat> so I guess this, this story isn't as impressive as it was originally when I, when I figured they were standing up resolvers and, and they were failing again, because I don't think that was actually happening. And I, well, <clears throat> maybe by tomorrow, if I present this at NanoG, it'll, um, it'll be a better story. Um, and one of the other kind of interesting things, certainly from my perspective or from a development perspective, is that inside the resolver, we keep contexts. So if you imagine a recursive resolver, it receives lots and lots of queries from clients. And most of those queries are satisfied immediately from the cache, and we can respond um, to the client, and we can completely forget about the transaction, keep statistics, and throw it away. Um, if the query needs to be resolved upstream, then we have to keep context about uh, who that client was, what they were asking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this graph is the number of context slots that we pre-allocate um, in the resolver, and the blue is the number of context slots that are actually in use. So during the, um, the attack, <clears throat> we used up a whole ton of context slots. We have excessively large number of uh, context slots here um, because we want to be able to take denial of services on the chin. Um, so we want to be able to kind of fill this when necessary with, with spikes of traffic. Um, but this sort of thing is really painful for the resolver. It looks like it's, it's, it's not a great deal. But in terms of um, uh, serve fail traffic, it's really painful because what will tend to happen is we'll get a huge number of attacks. A lot of those attacks will piggyback on the upstream queries that are already taking place. Um, but then all of a sudden, everything times out all at once. And we, the resolver spends an awful lot of time um, mucking around trying to find the context of the query that's just timed out. It's not an optimal, optimal path. Yep. Okay, yep, sorry. Um, there are future technologies. Um, just uh, in, in one quick sentence, I won't go through the slides. Um, one of the things that we can obviously do with our freeze list is instead of dropping things in the floor, we should be sending TCs back. If we can send a TC back and then get a query over TCP, then it means that the client is real and we're actually giving them a real, um, we have a good reason to give them a real response. Um, and that's, that's one of the kind of big focuses that I'm, I'm going to look at doing next. Um, that's it. Thank you. I don't know if there are any questions. Any questions from the floor? Peter Popovich, Farsight Security. Um, you talked about false positives and the very low number of false positives. Is there some way that you're detecting those programmatically, or is there a signature for false positives? Or are, you, or are those issues that are reported to you by a domain owner? Or how, do you, how, do you, how are you coming up with those numbers? Um, it's very untechnical. Um, it's either reported through support or via blogs, et cetera. Um, okay. It's the only way we can, we can tell. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was, awesome. that was a, indeed a really good presentation. Um, so our next speaker is um, Christian Petrach from DINIC. Um, can we use the ODP version, Dave? That one? Yeah, got it. Uh, who's going to make a presentation about minions and continuous integration? Oh. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Christian Petrus from <laughs> DNIC. Um, since seven years, uh, DNS operator at DNIC. Um, and I will present our uh, new um, automation platform with uh, continuous delivery techniques for the 
name server infrastructure. At first, I will uh, give you a short overview about our old structures. We have um, two top-level domains for our own and uh, several TLD customers uh, with Anycast service on our platform. We have uh, nearly 300 name servers to maintain. And it's this configuration of this name servers and the administration of the name servers was uh, made in the past with CF Engine 2. And we roll out software with CF Engine 2. And um, we had virtualization with server images and uh, monitoring with snatchers. So there were several problems because of this um, type of maintenance and administration. The server images were hard to maintain, and CF Engine was um, a little bit oversized for only managing name servers. Uh, and to update CF Engine uh, from version 2 to uh, CF Engine 3, the, we had to do a lot of uh, policy configuration, and we decided mm, it's not so good. And the most important thing was that we have to do a lot of manual tasks with storages and uh, server rollout and monitoring and no centralized, uh, centralized uh, administration platform. And our routing control was a Perl script and it was not so reliable as it could be. Consolidate, consolidated, um, every change takes too much time and the old processes were not so handy because of the amount of servers. The images were not often updated because uh, it takes too much downtimes of all server equipment. And humans are doing failures and with a lot of manual configuration, we are doing it as well. So with the new hardware rollout we do, we knew something new. And then we thought about what to do. And because of our colleagues from the registry team are doing continuous integration, continuous delivery um, for our registry platform, we thought about to do it maybe for DNS. Could be nice. And the next thing was, what is continuous integration and continuous delivery? There are a lot of buzzwords in our mind, and it's a software-defined data center, immutable servers, what else? In reality, for DNIC, it was have infrastructure as code, have automated tests for everything, and a possibility to change something without outages. Of course, DNS is, uh, has a lot of redundancy, so the other thing and uh, another type of no outages, but we uh, don't have um, downtimes. So we uh, need a staging infrastructure and a possibility to integrate updates uh, and changes continuously. The set is the short trip to our uh, registry platform. Um, where is the... Okay, um, our registry platform has two production environments, a blue one and a green one, and a load balancer, a development stage and an integration stage. The so development stage, um, the employee will do something, he will develop something and will do manual tests, and then it will be automated tested and uh, in the integration stage and roll out to the production stage. It's like this. We do input here, then we will do the tests there uh, in the integration stage, roll it out to the inactive stage, the blue one, and after a successful rollout and test, we switch the load balancer uh, connection, and the blue stage will be going active, and the rollout will be done in the uh, new non-active stage, and we do a production switch. So 
This could also be good for DNS. We have less outages, increased uh, uh, agility with changes and updates, and do better testing. Why not to do it with DNS infrastructure? So the benefits we want to get are reinstallation fully automated of a name server location, and because of the immutable servers, to have a big security increase, you have, uh, if you have possible malware or something strange on your servers, uh, after the reinstallation of the server, everything will be fine. And we want to have a, a technique to deploy and reinstall everything parallel, and so it, it could be possible to um, re reinstall all names of locations parallel. So the central administration platform should be possible, and we have new servers only with a button click, improved testing, improved monitoring, and so on. And for our customers, it could be also really good, because uh, in the past, we have a customer rollout with several weeks, with three weeks or four weeks, and now we have a rollout with customers. Uh, it should be possible to have a rollout with customers in two days and to implement updates really, really fast. So at first, we had to develop some concepts and ask us uh, several questions. What tools, what virtualization platform uh, for our registry we use uh, VMware and CF Engine 3 for configuration management? Should we use it uh, too? Or then we asked our minions, and um, we thought, okay, consolidate requirements and evaluate, and what to do with configuration management, and so on. At first, the requirements were highly reliable, a good cost efficiency, central administration, as I said, and it should be easy to use uh, as well. It uh, should be highly automated and with uh, the avoidable downtimes should be minimized. The next thing was a hypervisor decision and we tested three hypervisors um, for performance, cost efficiency and, and security. And the decision was Xen Server. Xen Server is now on free license so it's um, not expensive as VMware it is. And the security, the, it, it was important to, to have a good security between the virtual boxes on the name server locations because of the customers. So uh, the security of Xen is better than KVM. We decided to use Xen, and the performance was good enough as well. After that, we discussed a lot about the configuration management. Uh, and we decided not to use uh, oversized configuration management as we do it uh, in our registry infrastructure because we only need one configuration as uh, we reinstall the servers. We don't need uh, for DNIC to reconfigure the servers uh, in the running time at the moment, so we decided to use Coppola install server Coppola install server we are using for installation for, uh, of the name servers. So Coppola has the possibility to fill out templates and it has a good Python AP uh, so it can uh, interact with our other tools. And we had no need for CF Engine. This was a great thing because it's hard to uh, configure it, I think. That's my personal opinion. After this, uh, we thought about the orchestration, and the decision was Ansible. We need something which is a logic, and uh, Jenkins uh, is a graphical user interface. It, it's a build server, but we are uh, using it for um, a graphical user interface. And Ansible is uh, written in Python as well, so um, we can combine it good with Cobbler. It's easy to learn, and with SSH, you can use it nearly on every system. And at the end, we need several tools to complete the tool stack. 
and it is PostgreSQL for database and store all information. Python for development of software in this tool stack. We need uh, two tools, I come to this later, uh, to combine everything together. And NetConf for routing control, uh, to have a reliable routing control as well. So um, NetConf was easy to implement in Ansible because there are the modules, it was a great thing. And after we have the tools, we decided about the uh, deployment strategy, this blue-green thing we are doing with um, our registry platform. It has an advantage, we can build our servers uh, um, not in a current production environment, but um, this one disadvantage is double the hardware you need. And um, the other possibility was serial deployment, server by server. And um, this service, uh, the service could be provided, but it takes a little bit longer. The decision was a serial deployment because doubling the hardware was not really an option and one name server is enough to uh, rerun the service during the reinstallation. So it was a good thing to do it and later I will show you that it was a, a good decision. <laughs> The final processes were um, installation and reconfiguration of the servers, implemented automated testing, the administration of deployment and infrastructure, um, uh, routing administration, and central monitoring and logging. After the presentation, if somebody is, is really interested, I can show uh, some things. It takes too long during the presentation. That's the reason why I'm not presented live. So the um, tool stack we developed were with own development where the NSL name server location config tool. It's um, more a human readable interface for the database to uh, use the database more uh, easy. And uh, the Cobbler controller, as the name says, is for the communication with Cobbler ad systems or delete systems, do the management with the Cobbler. PostgreSQL, as I said, as a central database. And the Ansible is the logic behind Jenkins. We have no logic in our graphical user interface. Everything is uh, made with uh, Ansible. The new process for the DNS infrastructure is we have a development stage as our registry platform as well. We have every uh, server we have in the name server locations in this development stage. We have this uh, cobbler and a control server to control the whole installation process. We do development, commit it to our development stage, do the input, test it in the integration stage, and then do the serial rollout in the production stage. And during the serial rollout, there will be uh, several tests after reinstallation so that everything is running fine. In detail, it's um, something uh, like this. We have the name server location. We have the users doing input, the control server, the installation server, and the monitoring. And um, so the user will do the input, then the control server will take over uh, control. At first, it controls the monitoring. Then one name server will go to maintenance mode. Then it controls the routing. The name server will be out of the routing uh, automatically. It, the uplink will be, uh, will be removed. The installation will take place. Then tests will be done. And after this, the monitoring uh, controls the maintenance. And the uh, control server controls the routing. And the name server will be go back to in production mode. And the same will now happen with the other name server. We'll go to maintenance. Routing uh, will be going down. Installation, testing, and routing will going back. 
monitoring maintenance mode will be removed and the uh, name server location is reinstalled. So whole process with all server in a, in a location is taking nearly 45 minutes with new packets and security updates and everything with the cobbler uh, synchronization of the, of the new packets we need. It depends a little bit from the network connection and how, how far away the names of a location is. Here is uh, one slide which is showing a deployment of our names of a location in UK, the Unicast location. It was on uh, the 17th uh, September. And this is a DSC graph. We see uh, the names of us going out of the routing, the first one, then the second one, and this is the third one. And they are backing all up again, uh, all together. And this is a DNS mon graph. And um, it's a little bit small. The green one, this, is uh, London, is our UK location. And there are no lost queries. And I had an um, and filter of 10% um, until everything is not green. So I think uh, we have uh, uh, a successful deployment strategy. Sorry. We have two types of tests. We have integration tests and we have smoke tests. And the integration tests shown as this slide uh, um, tests we are running every night, and we are running with every testing stage rebuilt. So we test that um, the zone, the record types of the zone, which are included in the DE zone, only at the DE zone at the moment, but we could do it for customers as well. Um, that the name server can answer all record types. And we do a functional test with a name service uh, that is answering during reinstallation, that everything is working fine. And uh, a lightweight performance test um, at night with uh, DNS perf and UDP echo tests. Uh, so that if you implement a new as a name server software, there should be no surprises. The smoke tests we, we are doing uh, overall, for all servers, uh, we have tested monitoring, SSH, NTP, and so on is functional, and uh, all passwords are correct set, and we have a lot of hardening in our name servers uh, that these standards are fulfilled. Mm, for name servers especially, we check uh, that TSC is running, and unallowed AXFR is not possible, uh, and that name server could uh, answer on every configurated interface. After that, we have a lot of benefits. We had a central administration guy. Our rebuild could be uh, happen in 45 minutes, and the parallel installation of all locations is theoretically possible. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but it is possible because uh, the service will be provided during the reinstallation. And I think one of the best things is that the production readiness is ensured through smoke tests. So there should be no uh, uh, failures anymore. And um, we have automated monitoring. The snatches, manual configurations are uh, so, comp so hard to do and complicated so that uh, we use now SABIX with templates and it will be automatic integrated in our name uh, in names of our monitoring. So our future plans at the end um, will be to have SCN, software defined networking uh, in the future, to have the automation of hypervisor uh, installation. At the moment uh, we are working on it because that was something we put it in the backlog. And we want to rebuild the location faster and faster. And we would improve the test coverage more and more to be really sure that everything is working. But at the moment it is, but you can test better every time. So that's all. Thank you. And as I said, if somebody is interested to see more, I could do it uh, after the presentation. Thank you very much.
Randy, please. It's Randy Bush, IJN DRL. I, I'm just new and starting to figure out this DNS stuff. But what was interesting to me, what percentage of total router configuration can you push with Ansible and NetConf? At, at the moment, we are doing uh, the BGP prefixes. And uh, for uh, Unicast locations, uh, the, the transit announcements, yes, okay. and the server announcements. Uh, but Randy, uh, uh, to, uh, no, this day uh, my colleague Stefan from uh, our network team will arrive, so we can maybe have a talk together about this. Yes. I'm an Ansible addict, and you know, for servers it's wonderful. Still trying to get it to yeah. shove config up routers. I, I love it to do this with that con. <laughs> Peter Popovich, Farsight Security. You talked about um, failing, or the initial design for your registry platform, um, you, they could uh, switch over at the load balancer yes. uh, before they do the maintenance. Um, normally, folks choose that because they want to be able to fail back. Yes. Like after a deploy, if there's some problem in the deploy, you still have the entire old infrastructure and you fail back. With serial deployments, if you continue through the entire serial deployment without delays, um, then you've got the entire infrastructure upgraded and if you have to roll back, you're actually, you know, essentially doing a complete redeploy with the old version. Did you consider um, or did you evaluate doing slow deployments serially where you deploy, you know, 10% and then 20% and then 50% and then 100% or any, any of those structures? Was that was that part of what you evaluated? No, not at the moment. We, we are doing this integration tests, and if mm -hmm. we have a green build in the integration tests, is there the possibility to roll, out, uh, roll it out? Uh, but we not do it automatically. Mm -hmm. we, if we want to do it, we, play the, we, we, we push the tag of this green build mm -hmm. in, in the production, and, but not with a percentage rollout. <laughs> we were, so the follow-up question is, have you ever had to do a rollback? Have you ever found yourself in the position where you were, ooh, whoa, wrong. <laughs> you've got to deploy that. You've got to deploy we we can roll version. out only one server, as this is, uh, right. as this is possible. Uh, but at the moment, we roll forward, not mm -hmm. backward. Mm -hmm. OK. But uh, well, have you had to roll forward with the previous version? I mean, have you ever had, have you ever had a? Yeah, yeah, we had. Yeah. OK. Yeah, it, it was functional. <laughs> right, right. Cool. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, hola for Gottmann and, and Filippo Vassola. <laughs> From Cloudflare, they will talk about how they handle any queries. Uh, there, there is a couple of spots in the front rows uh, for those sitting on the back if you want a table and be more comfortable before the coffee break. If not, we can carry on. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Um, Filippo, my coworker, and I are going to give this as a Sherry presentation. I'll go over the first part, and then I will leave the room and leave everything and leave all the hate for him. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so, um, I decided to go for a provocative title on this talk. It's a hot topic, but. Uh, Hopefully, we can reach a consensus on doing something reasonable. Oops. Fine. OK. Any query is bad for some people. It is really bad for others. And uh, these are a number of the reasons why people don't like it. And. Uh, yeah, so it, we, it is not a normal query. It doesn't give you one type. It can give you any type there is in the CAS, whatever, or if from an alternative server, you could get lots of types, or you can, yeah. So it's an unreliable question. It's a meta type. Um, it's not very well specified. Uh, some people have read it as meaning all equals any, and some people read it uh, sum is equal to any. 
uh, a little word about what, why we care about any. Uh, Cloudflare operates lots of servers, a few thousand, uh, all over the world. We try to be really, 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 really fast. We want to be close to the users so we can answer fast, and the system is optimized for answering exactly the question that is being asked. Any does not fit our model. So answering any is expensive. We have to look a lot up in our systems to find the, assemble the answer if we are true giving everything. Um, and sometimes because of our distribution model and size, we don't have all of the information we need that could go into a possible answer at the end. So we have to fetch it from somewhere in the core. Um, there are not many any queries but, that are used in live production for useful purposes. But sometimes some geniuses decide that any is a good thing to ask to save them a round trip. Uh, one example was uh, this one. They decided they wanted a quad A and A at the same time and figured out any is going to give us that, so let's do it. Uh, they released uh, a version on that. People started complaining on their forums. They said, no, no, this is good. So we saw that after we saw the traffic going up and on, we wrote a blog. We wrote an ID. And the blog said, we are going to start uh, uh, returning not imp to all any queries. It's a very provocative statement. The effect was uh, uh, Mozilla backed down came out with a new release, said, OK, we didn't realize what was going on. So they were reasonable people. Lots of people came out of the woodworks and said, yes, this is a good idea. I hate any queries. I hate any queries. Any queries are bad for me. Everything related to any queries is bad. Yep. And security people came and said, oh, this is almost as bad as a zone transfer in leaking information. So, but. Sometimes I feel like Francisco Totti when dealing with any queries. Even my own fans yell at me when I do something wrong. Yes, promoting uh, not imp was a bad idea. Simple. Okay? And there are some legitimate reasons why you want to use any queries, but they are very few and very far between. There were a number of discussions on mailing lists. There was people talking about if you do this, that, or other things, and I will summarize that. People just started stating their usage cases. And, but an overall consensus seems to be that vast majority of the NS operators want to get rid of any queries. Question, who here wants to keep any query? <laughs> Randy? Okay, well, they were, uh, why was it there? I don't know. It's before my time in DNS. Hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is one program that we were accused of trying to kill. It's called QMail. It asks any query, uh, and uh, every time you say you don't want to answer any query, the, the chorus comes out, you're trying to make live miserable or kill Qmail. And this happened on the DNS soft working list. Uh, but because uh, Paul Wouters asked a uh, uh, question in a certain way, uh, the author of QMail decided to go to, into professor mode and explain exactly how QMail operates. After reading that long email, very good email, uh, we decided that yes, QMail is only using any as an optim attempt at optimization. As long as it gets a an useless answer to an any query, it will fall into normal processing. Go look for the MX records, A records, or whatever it is looking for. So, the point is, as long as we return something that is not useful, QMail will work perfectly fine. <laughs> then, we had uh, a moment talking about DDoS attacks in uh, the meeting in uh, Amsterdam and on a different topic, Bert Hubert, hi Bert, you're online, I know, <laughs> uh, said, give me a shut up option and I will stop asking. 
and that is the view from a resolver. So many of the any queries we get as authoritative are coming through a resolver. We want to try to sh sh have the resolvers handle them instead of keep forwarding us all these answers. So in solving the any problem, we need to take into account both the end systems, the intermediary resolvers, and the authoritative servers. We are only authoritative servers, so this is a talk from an authoritative site. Here are the different ways people have been talking about how to answer any queries. Some of them are harmful, some of them are okay. And we have, on the, our first proposal was harmful. Uh, the empty answer one, well, it may work, may not, but it's treated as an uh, empty answer, that the type does not exist. Well, somebody pointed out we could use an old behavior of bind, i.e. just to return a uh, referral every time we get an any query to ourselves. Well, there are some resolvers that get really confused by that. Really confused. Um, we could return any existing record type. That works very well. We could define a new type. Well, there are some uh, implementations that don't like new types. It's their problem, but fine. And then there are some resolvers out there and authoritative servers that try to guess what the end client wants and return that. Well, that may work, that may not work. We know what Qmail wants, but there are other uses of any that we have seen on our network. But the big discovery was if somebody asks for any, and they get the whole long list. Then somebody else asked for a particular type that is in the any answer. The resolvers don't return it. They send us another query. So the any answer they got only populates the resolver cache for future any queries and nothing else. But if they get another type into cast like, uh, by a direct query, then that one migrates into the future any answers. This has to do with the credibility that the resolvers use. So who sends us any queries? Well, we get Ford's reflection flaw. Like OpenDNS people talked about here earlier, there are bot services and they will send all kinds of traffic for payment to anybody who operates DNS or other services. Um, these happen once in a while. They're big. Uh, we get uh, these uh, floods via two kinds of resolvers, of open resolvers, um, the ones with and without the CAS. Um, we get it from a very good resolvers uh, that have an empty cache when they get asked. If they have something in the cache, hopefully they don't ask us. Um, there are users that are asking resolvers and we end up getting it because the cache is empty. Uh, we get a fair number of uh, any queries that seem to come directly from users because the addresses don't show any other DNS traffic or very little. And Recently, there seem to be some kind of a tools that are out there that I cannot classify that are not asking for the standard any names. So, I don't know what's going on there. And there may be others. It's hard to tell. The, tra the, um, the biggest problem from uh, the uh, authoritative side is this class of uh, resolvers. There are lots of them. 20, 30 million something like that. They will ask the question, they will answer it. Next time they get the question, they will ask it again. Sending them a TC bit, it's a very bad idea because they will happily come back with a TCP query. I don't want to, even with all of my other servers, I don't want to get 11 20 to 20 million uh, TCP connections to them. Just sorry. and. The biggest problem with them, I can't blacklist them. They all have users behind them, it seems like. In some cases, what I think is happening is there may be infected machines on a network, there is a uh, name server or resolver on the same network and they get knotted. 
So the resolver is behind the NAT, the infected machine is behind the NAT, so I can't tell the difference whether the query is coming from the resolver or from the infected machine. In many cases, we are seeing the resolvers behind NATs. So we are getting different query patterns. So blacklisting this will actually hurt users, so we can't do it. If we had uh, taken the time of building a total reputation database, we could possibly look at this and say, yes, this, uh, this open resolver is bad, but they keep sending questions, they keep sending questions. And for us, if our automated tools don't drop the traffic, answering the question is just simpler and cheaper. Um, we care because it's expensive for us as an authority server to answer any query. We're going to be design, uh, building out uh, and deploying DNSSEC on a massive scale in not too long, distant future. And if the types that we answer are not going to be used, it's a waste of our uh, resources to A, put them in the answer, and B, sign them. And when we are dealing with the different uh, types of uh, queries, this is uh, the scales we're dealing with. When I say millions, I'm not telling you whether it is single digit, double digit, or triple digit. But it's massive. We may, uh, this uh, week, uh, I have seen too any ad attacks on it, uh, aimed at our infrastructure. Probably all of them are aimed to be reflection attacks. Uh, so, we don't, anything that is orange or green, we wouldn't mind taking that load. It's no big deal. It's how do we deal with the red ones? Okay, and now for the controversial part. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So while Olafur leaves uh, the building, takes a taxi and leaves to avoid the Q&A session, <laughs> uh, I will tell you about how we uh, finally solved this, our final solution. So uh, you can probably see where this is going. Uh, we need uh, to answer something. It needs pro possibly to be human readable so that humans can actually uh, get what's going on. It would be good if uh, it was cached. So we look at, at, our, um, at our system, our authoritative server, and we looked for a type that is not used or supported by our um, control panel. So uh, all of who picked uh, H-info, as a, a type with text fields that could would be shown to the user. And we, we just uh, started to answer a, a simple hinfo record generated on the fly every time we get a, any query. So if you uh, ask for uh, any directly to our authoritative uh, name server, you will get just this single R set, which is very cheap to generate, obviously, because um, and we will not uh, have to go into the database and do match uh, prefix matches and, and look for long lists of R sets. This will get cached, but it will not uh, end up poisoning other caches. And most importantly, this won't fail a request. So, for example, QMail or other deployed applications will get something which fits the specification of any and will keep working. So. As I said, there's no need for a new type because we had this essentially unused type uh, in, in our system. We can generate it on the fly, no need for database lookups, no need for uh, discovery. We don't have to make multiple signatures, obviously. And we have simplified uh, our authoritative uh, name server code vastly. I think I went in and did one of the most beautiful things uh, a programmer ca can do and removed code. 200 lines of burning code. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, it will be uh, cached uh, as is, as we uh, discovered by uh, resolvers, by actual deployed resolvers. So they will just keep answering that for just for any queries. Um, and actually not even uh, answer that if you ask for HINFO directly. That was kind of uh, unexpected, but still even better uh, be behavior. And finally, it's accepted by res resolvers, so the caching ones will not keep asking us. So just one word about uh, DNSSEC sign zones. Uh, there, is, there, there is no way around signing this record when uh, the zone is signed because 
uh, giving an assigned answer will cause the result, validating resolvers to ask all the authoritative naming servers, which is already not exactly something you want to happen. And then they will just go bogus because they will not see a signature. Bogus will result in a surfail, and surfail will result in uh, Qmail giving up on the entire uh, name resolution chain, and mail will not be delivered. Um, anyway, we have, a, uh, we, as presented uh, at the other DNS work meeting, we have uh, on the fly signing uh, DNSX system, and it, it's, it, it doesn't really look into the database, so it didn't no changes to to, uh, to sign uh, this, a, this particular record. Um, the same technique can actually work not just for us. It, it can work for uh, traditional DNS servers. For unsigned zones, it's trivial. Just create a H info on the fly uh, for the name and answer with that. Um, signed zones are obviously more tricky because uh, if uh, zones are signed offline, uh, they will have uh, either to sign one H info and prepare it for each name that exists and have that ready to answer, or pick, uh, they can just pick one RR set from their database and answer that. Negative answers are not really a problem because a negative an uh, a NX domain answer to any costs as much as a NX domain answer to any other type. So, um, Picking one R set is not what we went for because of our database uh, backend, but uh, regular name servers probably have less of a cost uh, in doing this. So um, we, we had this idea. We, this was already the second iteration. How did we know that we weren't going to break all two mails on the world, make uh, uh, DJB sad, and anyway, make mail uh, not be delivered? Uh, we started testing in a lab. We have our small lab network. We uh, started trying running application against this, um, this authoritative name server. Um, we checked with the implementers what they told uh, about it. And we started testing on a portion of the internet and monitored, obviously, graphs uh, for anything uh, particular and yeah, the very non-technical way of uh, checking Twitter and uh, emails for compliance. So um, it's now deployed in uh, a, a portion of uh, our Anycast network, which in theory should be the one that's reachable from here. Now, Anycast, so mm. <laughs> possibly not, possibly yes. Um, we didn't get complaints, compliance, we didn't get uh, tweets, the graphs are mostly unchanged, except what we'd ex we would expect. Um, you can try it. Uh, we have um, a proxy uh, that will literally just proxy your requests to uh, cloud for name servers, and it, it will be turned down in a couple days, and it's just uh, on the right network path to let you see what, uh, what people that are exposed to the beta are seeing. Um, there is still not, no support for signed zones, which is coming in the next release. So this is it. Um, <laughs> you're coming back. I'm surprised. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's still a, already a queue. It's sure. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, it's possible to find simple solutions to, uh, to complex problems, and it's usually possible also to find solutions that work with deployed applications, even if that's usually the very hard part. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Roy Adams um, for ICAM. Um, first off, I think this is very cool that you guys do this. Um, it's kind of betting the company on this hack, so it's and it works, and it's it's absolutely. I mean, I, I like it. The um, you mentioned though, and this is the reason I got up um, that um, uh, if you want to do this with a signed zone, you basically have to sign on the fly. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> sorry, if you sign the zone with opt out. Right, you can mm -hmm. basically inject an unsigned delegation to an unsigned zone, and that server that serves the unsigned zone can basically just reply with the H info record, and you haven't signed anything, and this works too. Great. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Write it up for. You, 
you, you, you got probably two cichlis back. So. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Uh, I will, uh, like we showed, there is in the H info, there is a draft out about this that Joe Adley from Dine and uh, myself are working on, and we will add, happy to add that text to it. So send text, Roy. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So, Rafi Manon, can you explain how this will work or what the semantics will be? Because I didn't get that fully. If you send something to uh, an any query to something that is an NX domain normally, but now you are sending back something, or? Uh, no, we will send back an NX domain. So you, you know in the database that it's kind of. NX we know whether the name exists or not. Okay. Hi, uh, David Lawrence Akamai. Just two quick uh, comments on the draft. One was about signed zones, and that is the draft actually says you may sign, send back an unsigned answer. Um, so you should definitely correct that text. We discovered that didn't work always. Yeah, and then the other was that uh, Dan Bernstein's motivation in QMail was actually to detect C names, and the draft doesn't say anything about what if you get an a, an any request for a C named name. So you should probably indicate that you actually return the C name in that case, not an H info. Um, I think that the uh, process of QMail is uh, answering uh, queuing first for any, and then queuing for C name explicitly. Uh, right, but overall, like. Since C name is a specially processed record, what you're doing about a name that has a C name should be called out in the draft explicitly, even if okay, your yeah, answer see, is see. still. Yeah, uh, anyway, it, um, the answer will be uh, uh, essentially the same, and the plot applications will uh, will retry with C name. I'm switching positions now. Um, <laughs> I'm relaying a query a uh, question from Beth um, Hubert um, in the webcast about. See, if all of do you have a theory about what these cacheless uh, resolvers are? Uh, based on an earlier work I did, I believe 99% of them are uh, CPEs running DNS mask. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Dwayne Wessels from VeriSign. Um, you said that uh, the, the traditional responses to any queries don't get cached. They get cached, but only reused for any. Oh, okay. But your age info response gets cached and reused? For any. For any. So. And only for any. It, is that because it only has one record type in the response, or? No, that's because what it gets it back in the answer for any gets stuck in the cache in the any in a, under the type any. Yeah, you, ca you can actually uh, test this by um, queuing a caching resolver for any that will return you, a, let's say, an X, amongst other things, and then queuing for that an X before the TTL expiration, and it will take the time to uh, go uh, to the authoritative server and the uh, uh, TTL will be refreshed, okay. which is kind of uh, unexpected. And the other way around, instead, the any answer that you make next will contain the refreshed uh, TTL that you refresh by asking for an X. That's right. the. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Hey, Paul Artis. Um, one curious question. Since the H info really only contains text, and we have this record type specifically for text called TXT, I was wondering why you didn't use a TXT record. Uh, the problem is that obviously we have uh, we do have txt uh, our sets in uh, our system, and we would have to like go check if txt exists at that name, to, uh, not to split their set and choose a different type. We wanted a type that we didn't have, we never answer if not for this. Uh, basically, Paul, the answer is uh, SPF records are now stored as TXT records <coughs> in lots of our customer zones, so, and we don't want to interfere with that in any way, shape, or form. In their infinite wisdom, the mail people decided SPF record was not a good idea, and they went back to TXT. So you're basically throwing H info under the bus. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was already under the bus by security people uh, about 25 years ago. Sure. Uh, we, we needed the type to uh, throw under the bus. Uh, in our system, <laughs> sure. It, sure. it was a cheap. But <laughs> maybe we can have an under the bus type record. <laughs> <laughs> U-bus. I like it. <laughs> and, and then and another question I had, um, which you probably don't have the answer to, is um, people always talk about QMail and how, how much it is used everywhere and how this is a really big problem because they're doing these any queries. 
as far as I know, most of the QML installs actually running in production are based on the Debian or Ubuntu packages, and they all have patched this hack out. So I'm actually wondering how much of a problem this whole QML thing is to begin with. But I know you don't have to answer for that, so you don't have to answer. Like I said, we are getting uh, in the thousands of any queries a second, and um, yeah, most of them are for names that look like they are looking for mail-related information. Um, Paul Hoffman, so three things. One, to answer the, uh, Bert's question on, on what's doing the, uh, which are the open ones. So they are mostly DNS mask, but DNS mask is mostly used by OEMs, and OEMs use different configs. Sometimes the same OEM will change configs at times. So there's no easy way to say it's these boxes. And just to be clear, when you said CPE, whether that's correct, but they're not just home boxes. A lot of Soho boxes, a lot of small office boxes mm -hmm. also use DNS masks because that's the easiest thing for an OEM who doesn't know anything about the DNS to turn on to say that they do DNS. Um, I also wanted to correct one thing that you said about the caching of um, NEs that, you know, these people don't put them, you know, don't break it out and put it in the cache. Um, I think you're overgeneralizing. Some ca some recursors yeah. actually do do that, yeah, yeah, and yeah. others don't, yeah. based yeah, on configuration. So I, I mean, I think a couple people in the audience heard you say that oh, no. resolvers don't do that, and some do and some don't. No, I think no, that's I important because that's why HINFO is a reasonable thing to use, because unless they were using HINFO themselves for some purpose, you, you get both the advantage for any and for HINFO. And as far as I know, no one's using HINFO for anything these days. Um, it might, it, it's sort of a private use thing. So I, I believe that you're doing the right thing by using HINFO versus inventing a new one, even if we didn't have the problem of new ones have a problem. I, I, HINFO is so unused that that completely overwhelms a, any other you know, purpose for it, so. Um, I personally, I would use a much shorter message. Why even say that? The number of people who would be reading these are so small, and those people wouldn't know what a draft is, much less an RFC. When I wouldn't make it zero length because there are certain resolvers that freak with zero length strings. But I think you could say hi and just leave it at that. Uh, actually, you. all the draft that uh, we put out uh, recommend you put uh, the RFC number in. Sure. And so just doing that, there's no reason to say much more. Yeah, but this is just, as we are the first ones doing it, we have a long message right now. We'll take that out. Yes. Randy. Randy Bush, IIJ and DRL. I have two confessions. One is I'm a major Dan Bernstein fan, and credit also should go to Dr. Langa. Um, and secondly, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember why any only responds to any caching and that was cash poisoning back in early bind days, trying to reduce that. And I have some doubts about folk who are splitting up any responses and caching them and how poison proof they are. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Brian Summers from OpenDNS. Um, so it occurs to me that a way of dealing with this where nobody can possibly complain about what you're doing is to define an NERR <laughs> and respond with that. <laughs> uh, I will hand over the evil DRS idea baton to you now. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. According to my clock, that was like 18 minutes of presentation, 12 minutes of questions, new record. Um, that's the last presentation from this track. Um, thank you very much. I hope you find um, really interesting work. Um, we're breaking now for coffee until 11. Uh, Keith, do you have anything to say to wrap up? No, you're free to go for coffee. So see you back at 11. <laughs>